Hello, welcome to Bibliophiles, the show on AADL TV, where we take a few moments on each episode to discuss one book topic, where we each choose a different selection to discuss. My name is Amanda, and as always, I am joined by Christopher and Lucy, and this week we are discussing books that are women in translation, so books written by women that have been translated into English. So I'm excited to hear what everybody brought to share today. Let's go ahead and hear what Christopher brought. Well, I read this book, The Unwomanly Face of War by Svetlana Alexievich. Since we're talking about women in translation, I also want to mention the translators. They were Richard Pevere and Larissa Volokhonsky. This book won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2015, but it was originally published in 1985. So this is a unique book. It collects over 200 stories. They're really short passages from women who fought in World War II um, by, from the Soviets. And these women talk about all aspects of their life at the front. There are pilots and snipers and radio operators and nurses and surgeons and anti-aircraft gunners and machine gunners and you know, it just runs the gamut of different roles that these women took uh, in World War II. This is not a glamorous book. It really tries to show the horror, the unrelenting mud, the gore, and the blood of the war. Um, I think one of the pervasive feelings I got from it was just how exhausted everyone is constantly. They're they're on their feet asleep and they have to keep moving. And anyway, it it the book has a the book has a big impact on the reader. Um because it's it's the war told from quite a unique perspective. Um the author begins the book with a long passage directly addressing the reader, talking about how she collected all the stories and even about conversations she had with the censors. And you really get a sense of what censorship is for. And the censors overtly say, you know, this is not a glamorous view of war. We need a more beautiful, dreamlike, inspiring truth of what war is, or else who will go to war? <laughs> and that's one of her points, I feel like. She wants to show how terrible war is and how unglamorous it is, for sure. So that is The Unwomanly Face of War by Svetlana Alexievich. Uh, Lucy? What did you What did you read for this episode? Um, didn't you before I said? Didn't you write another book also that's like a, a, another collection of people's voices, maybe from Ukraine? Yeah, yeah. I really want to read. Um, those books have been on my list for a while, so now we'll get to it. Um, I read this book. It is called The Pachinko Parlor, and it is written by Alyssa Shua Disipin, and it is translated from the French by Anissa Abbas Higgins. Um, I was surprised. I, I saw this in a bookstore and um, I was interested in the title because I liked another book I read about Pachinko and I um, saw that it was a translated book. I knew we had to read one and I figured that it was a book that was translated from Japanese because it was taking place in Japan. Um, but the writer is actually... Um, French. She was born in France. She's French Korean. Um, and she lived a long time in Switzerland. So she writes in French. So this book is actually translated from French, but I didn't realize that until I was like reading it. I was like, I don't know. I looked at the trans the translator's bio and I realized that. So anyway, um, the main character of the book is a woman named Claire who is Swiss Korean and she is going to spend her summer in Tokyo with her Korean grandparents, her grandparents came to Tokyo about 50 years before they were kind of sent from Korea. Um, and they are the owners of a pachinko parlor, not one of the big commercial ones, but a smaller one called the shiny. Um, and she 
goes to Korea to spend the summer with them in part because she wants them to take a trip back to Korea from Japan and she wants to go with them. Um, so she doesn't speak very much Korean. Her grandparents don't, won't speak Japanese at all in their house. They refuse to. Um, and so they kind of have to communicate with a little bit of English, but they're not very good at communicating Claire with her grandparents. Um, her main language is French, but she is very proficient in Japanese and she gets hired while living in Tokyo as a tutor for a 10 year old Japanese girl so that she can teach this Japanese girl French and they bond really quickly. Um, and that's kind of a, a part of the story I really liked was their relationship. And, um, the little girl keeps begging Claire to take her to her grandparents' pachinko parlor. She thinks it would be really an interesting and cool thing to do. When the little girl's mother finds out that Claire's grandparents own a pachinko parlor, she immediately sort of becomes disdainful of Claire and um, like says some really, you know, pejorative things about, about Koreans in Japan. And Claire is sort of speechless uh, when this is told to her and it's it's an interesting parallel to her grandparents who have kind of remained speechless the whole time they've been living in Tokyo because they've refused to not I mean they've refused to speak Japanese understandably because they were kind of forced to move to Japan from Korea but they also um, they don't have a community there and they don't have any Korean roots there it's a very short book, but I actually learned a lot about pachinko. It's really interesting. Um, the pachinko parlors in Japan are exclusively owned by Koreans. And um, they were created because gambling was illegal in um, Korea. And when the Koreans got displaced to Japan, they had a, they were also excluded from the black they were excluded from any commerce there in any way even the black market so they came up with their own way of making money gambling is also illegal in um japan did i say japan or korea before anyway it's illegal in both but in japan how they get around that is they don't ever give you money when you win they give you prizes and then there's this whole other black market for prizes so it's really like this fascinating world which was kind of a little side note but um, it's looked down upon in a lot of ways, but then it's also like the, the visited by many Japanese people. Um, so another part of this book is Claire sort of watching the people who come in and out of the shiny. And that's really interesting. But what's most interesting about this book, I think, to talk about as far as a book being in translation is that it's really a book about language and translating the language you're hearing and the ability to speak another language and sort of this blurred border between languages. Um, it doesn't, it's, it's kind of slow, but in a really nice meditative, reflective way. It's like, I would say that the power of the book is from the emotion, not from like the events in the book, not from the, the plot. Um, but the writing is really beautiful and the characters are very memorable. And it just is a lot about like finding yourself through language through your past, discovering hidden histories, and and ultimately Claire and her grandparents sort of end up having this really nice relationship. Um, so I was just, I didn't know anything about this book before I picked it up, and I was so pleasantly surprised by it. Um, I really enjoyed it. As I said, it's very short, so I recommend it because it doesn't take long to read, but there is a lot in it. So that is The Pachinko Parlor by Alyssa Shua Duzepin. Uh Amanda, what do you have for us? I have something a bit different. The book I chose to discuss is called Lemon, and it is by Kwon Yo Sun, and it is translated from the Korean by Janet Hong. So this book, it's pretty slim. Um, I was looking through the list of books to pick from, and this one um, was newer. It was short, and I just like the snappy cover that I saw online, so I grabbed it. It's short. It's just under 150 pages, and it spans... Well, first of all, it's a psychological suspense mystery. Um, it starts out in 2002. It's um, summer and Korea is hosting um, the World Cup game and everyone's a buzz with that. And then this body of this high school girl is found. She's like 17, 18 and her body is found. And she was um, beautiful, gorgeous, very well known in school. 
And so it ends up being called a high school beauty murder. And the book spans um, 2002 to 2019. Each chapter has, is a different year. So you kind of bounce around. There's also three different narrators. And you definitely know that one of the narrators is the sister, but I spent the book not quite trying to figure out who the narrators were, but confirming who I thought they were, if that makes any sense. Um, Cause I thought they were and who they were. And then when the end came, I just kind of went back and forth a little bit weird. It doesn't really matter. Um, the book focuses on, so you've got this death of this girl and her mom and her sister and the community are just changed. And so her sister is trying to solve and figure out who the killer is. So it's very suspenseful and it's slow, but it's also a page turner as like little clues are trying to be revealed, but you're still not quite sure who is quite doing the speaking all of the time. If that, But it's done in such a way where it's, it's okay that you're a little bit like confused and wondering because you're literally just opening the book and reading these words and you're feeling the pain and the grief and the trauma that like there are um, the three narrators, it's the sister. And then there's two other teenagers that were two other girls that were friends with um, or knew the other girl and her sister who died. So you've got these different perspectives of how the day went. And these are teenage girls or remembering what it was like to be the teenage girls, like when the murder had happened. So you've got this like, grief you've got this jealousy over looks like the younger sister who is a survivor like she's not as beautiful as her sister at all so she decides to get all of these plastic surgeries to try to go through and kind of accept the death of her sister and the mom has her own thing where she decides she wants to change the dead daughter's name to what she really wanted to name it and it talks about like the how their father died when they were younger it's just really interesting and then you get into the voices of these other narrators and how their daily lives are and some of their own griefs and traumas. And it's really interesting. It's, I haven't read anything else like it before and I do recommend it. It's not the best book I've read, but it's, it's just different and unique. And I like the way that it was written from these three different voices. And of course I love like a little, like a murder mystery um, where it's like suspense, but it's also psychological because you do feel, you feel bad and you feel icky reading about these characters. Um, but yeah, so and Lemon is the reference there. Um, one of the girls or a couple of the girls are into poetry. And so Lemon is part of some of the lines of one of the poems that one of the girls mentions in the story. So that's where Lemon came from. There's also the color yellow pops up in a couple of different things. So I just thought it was interesting. It was very well done. It got really, really good reviews. And I never heard of it before. The back of the book says, Parasite meets the good sun in this piercing psychological portrait of three women hunted by a brutal unsolved crime. So I was like, sounds good. Um, so I, I'm glad I read it. It's a fast read. Like I said, it's under 150 pages. So I, I recommend it as um, a, a book written by a female author that was translated into English. I think it, I think it was really well done. Uh, the writing is really, really, really good. And I could see it just written in like straight English or not being translated. I just, it, it, the story can come from anywhere. I thought it was, I thought it was pretty cool. So we've got three different stories that were translated that we talked about today. Um, does anybody have any other final thoughts or comments on the topic or any of our book choices today? Um, I do want to add, I forgot to say that the author, both the author and the translator of this book are winners of the National Book Award for book and translation in 2021. Not for this book, but for a book they wrote previously or wrote and translated called Winter in Sokcho, which I also want to read. But I just wanted to mention that they were national book award winners that's that's cool. yeah. yeah that's definitely a cool thing to say because that's a big one mm -hmm. cool. yeah. um all right well that is our episode for today discussing books by women that were in translation thank you so much for joining us if you have any books in translation you would like to share with us or others you can drop a comment below and thank you for tuning in we'll see you next time